Good morning. Welcome to our live stream service from National City, Southport Christian Center. We're so glad you're here in person or you're listening in at home, and we just pray God's blessing upon you. We just read a wonderful scripture about those who wait upon the Lord, that he will renew our strength, and we surely need that in the day we live in, don't we? Would you stand with me as we give this day to the Lord? Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are to us. Thank you for the promises you have made, and you always keep your promises. And with joy, we wait upon you, Lord. We renew our strength day by day, that we may run and not be weary, and walk and not faint. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you for your precious word. Meet everyone listening in today, and may they find you in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now let's join Pastor Rick and the worship team as they lead us in worship. Oh, glory to God. Amen. You know, in times of trouble, we need to call upon the Lord sometimes. Amen. Amen. It's time to, and sometimes it gets to that point where you just say, you know what? I'm calling the boss. That's it. You know, you had enough of the devil, and you just got to tell him sometimes, you know what? I'm telling Jesus on you. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> you know, so let's, let's do that this morning. You know what? Let's just lift our hands today and just say, you know what, Lord? I'm going to just call upon you today. Come and just be here with me, and I'm going to worship you with all I have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together like this.
so wonderful. How oh, we serve a mighty God. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this world right now. A lot of things that may seem like, man, God, where are you? Where are you? Or you can just turn to your head towards heaven and say, Jesus, come quickly. Yeah. Come quickly, yeah. Lord Jesus. Yeah. And some other people, some people are saying are in situations where, God, you just need to do something here. I need you. I need your presence in my life. Can I tell you right now, he's up to something. God is doing something. He is up to something when? Right now.
Christ. Turn around that situation. Only you can do it, Lord. Praise your name. Lord, we just lift up your name today. We give you praise and we honor you. For you are worthy. Yes, you are worthy, Jesus. Can we take a moment and just lift our voice to him? Just sing a song out to the Lord. You are worthy, Jesus.
you to join us. So instead of going out that door, go down the stairs and it'll be out here on our playground. If you've been here for one before, you will know that. And if um, you came to be baptized, we will give you instructions later. We'll serve a light lunch after and you're all invited to attend that as well. Mothers with babies, I want you to know that we have a minimal facility in my office for you to use. And so make yourselves at home there. Well, it's wonderful to see all of you here today, and I know the Lord has amazing things in store for us. Hasn't worship been wonderful? We have three brothers here that are so precious to us all the days of their life. Wesley, Shiloh, Connor, would you guys stand up, please? Thank you. And Shiloh's going to be baptized today. Thanks, guys. We'll be hearing from him later. <laughs> Tyler, it's wonderful to welcome you here as well. Thank yeah. you. Well, God bless you. We're glad each one of you has come. How many of you come expecting God to do something amazing? Yeah. I want you to know that's exactly what he's going to do for us today as we trust him. Right now, it's time to receive our offering. And you people are the most giving people I know. So God bless you as you pay your tithe and give your offerings. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to give back to you that which you have given to us. Your faithfulness amazes us, Lord. Through the pandemic, you have supplied jobs to your people. You've directed their paths, and we give you praise for your provision. So it's with joy, Lord, that we give to the ministries of this church. Take part in all that you're doing through Southwood Christian Center. We give you praise in Jesus' name. God bless you, ushers.
us to just um, lift it up as a, as a prayer to him as we say this morning. Peace of God, cover me, cover me.
storm. A big one, a little one. He's the God of all storms. When the sea is roaring and the tempests and the waves are big, he's there. When they're small, he's there. What a joy it is to love and serve him. Boys and girls, young people, you may be dismissed now to go to your classes. Brother Pete will be serving our youth today. Let's pray for them as they go. chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for 1,000 of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousands. Then he commanded that the gold and silver vessels that had been taken from the house of God in Jerusalem be brought to him. And he and his guests drank from them. Verse 4 says, And they praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, verse 5 took place. In the same hours, the finger of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the, blood, the lampstand on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote Imagine yourself at that banquet. You're sitting there, you're drinking, you're a bit out of your mind. And then you look up on the wall, and there's just the fingers of a man's hand writing words that you don't understand. In his drunken condition, verse 6 says, this is how the king viewed it. His countenance changed, his thoughts troubled him, the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. I would say he was pretty frightened, and wouldn't you and I have been at such an unexpected happening? Then he called for all the astrologists, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, to tell him what the handwriting on the wall meant. He promised them royal garments and gold chains and the position of third ruler in his kingdom. They all came. But none of them could interpret the writing on the wall. Then, says the king, was greatly troubled, and again his countenance changed. Then the queen spoke up and said, Don't be troubled, in verse 11. There's a man in your kingdom, and who is the spirit of the holy God? And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. She went on to say, that King Nebuchadnezzar had made him chief of all of his wise men. <coughs> the queen continued in verse 12 to describe what to, Dan, to the king what Daniel was like. He says, he's a man of excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas. Then she said, let the king call him, and he will give the interpretation. Now, this is the Daniel that survived the lion's den, the one that refused to obey the king's command and was thrown into the den of lions. So Daniel is now brought before the king. In verse 13, the king said, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father brought from Judah? Verse 14, I've heard of you. 
Do you ever go someplace and people would say, I've heard of you, your reputation had preceded you. That's what the king said about him today, <coughs> I've heard of you. That the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Again in verse 16, the king said, I've heard of you. The king went on to say, I called my wise men and they could not interpret this. But if you can, I will clothe you and I will give you a gold chain and make you the third ruler in my kingdom. And in verse 17, Daniel answered the king, Let your gifts be for yourself. Give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. The following verses, Daniel reminded them of God's blessing upon his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, of the might and majesty and glory and honor that God had bestowed on him. And then he went on to say in verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Daniel went on to explain that he was driven from men into the field ate grain like an oxen, his nails grew and his hair grew, and he was there for seven years till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints whomever he chooses. And Daniel went on to say in verse 22, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all saying, you saw what happened to your father because he did not honor the God of heaven. You knew all this, and you didn't do it either. Verse, the next verse, 23. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have brought the vessels of his house to you, and you have drunk from them and worshipped gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And listen to this. And the God who holds your breath in his hand. How many of you know God holds your breath in his hand? Amen. We're that fragile, aren't we? Are we promised tomorrow? No. He holds our breath in his hand. And he owns all your ways. And you have not glorified him. Then Daniel said, God sent the fingers from his hand. Can you imagine that? God sent the fingers from his hand to write on your wall. Mini, mini, tiko, you farsen. And I'm going to interpret what he said, said Daniel. Number one, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. It's not good news for a king. God's counted your days and your years, and they're over. And you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And weighed your life, and added up to zero. Your kingdom has been divided and will be given to the Medes and Persians. Verse 30 tells us what happened. That very night, Belshazzar the king was slain, and Darius the Mede took over his kingdom. These kings had seen and known the miraculous ways of God, yet they had not humbled themselves nor submitted themselves to his lordship. Think of knowing all this and still going on in your own way. As I read those words, I thought, it sounds like the leaders of our day. Wow. They know what our country was founded upon. They know the Constitution. They know our forefathers and their plan. But you know what? God always has a remnant. A small group, sometimes only one, who will seek his face and intercede for a divine intervention. There was Abraham who interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. There was Noah in the days before the flood. 
he preached and he preached and he built and he built and they made fun of him. He said, there's no water. Why are you building a boat? But he kept telling the story as he did the work God had given him to do. Then there was Elijah on Mount Carmel with the Baal worshipers. He was the only one against so many. And they had all gathered and they said, whoever, whichever God answers by fire, that will be the true God. If you know that story, you know the true God came through, just as he did for Noah, just as he did for Abraham. Then there was Moses with the children of Israel so many times, begging God not to kill them. He said, anybody has to die, let it be me, but spare your children. We don't want the Egyptians to say that you brought them out here in the wilderness and then let them die. So he would intercede with the children of Israel, and God came through. Then there was Joshua facing the enemies of the Lord, standing alone. And God, if you don't help us, who will? Then there was David facing Goliath, the only one. Here were the Philistines on one side, the children of Israel over here. They were shaking in their boots. The Philistines were so excited, so proud, because they had the biggest man in the world, nine feet tall. He was walking up and down every day, threatening the Israelites. And God's people were saying, didn't know about cover me. And so David went to the king and he said, I will take the Philistine. Uh, and the king said, not you. You're just, just a lad. You're just a little boy. You take care of sheep. You're a shepherd. You're not a warrior. The king wasn't going. The king said, here, wear my armor. Can you imagine this little boy putting on a man's armor? I get the picture, don't you? Nothing fits. David said, no, I can't use this. Because I'm not depending on armor. I'm not depending on how big I am, how strong I am. You know what his weapons were? Five smooth stones. How many did he need? He was well prepared. And he was very good with that slingshot. He had even killed bears and lions with his own hands. And he said, the same God who helped me then, O king, will help me now. Amen. Yes. And I'm sure the king was saying, that, oh no, this is not going to be good. That little boy going against nine feet, I don't think so. But he watched. The Bible says he watched with the children of Israel. David went out to meet the giant. Then there was Daniel and the three Hebrew children. They were very much alone. Then there was Jonah, who interceded for Nineveh. And God heard his cry. One, God will use anybody that will let him. Amen. He needs every one of you. Because each of you faces giants the rest of us don't face. I want you to know the God that we've been singing about this morning will be there to help you as he was to help these dear ones. Amen. The psalmist wrote these words, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Any time a nation honors God, that nation is blessed. Yeah, yeah. King Solomon wrote these words, Righteousness exalts a nation lifts them up above all the others. That's what the United States of America is used to because we have been a righteous nation. With God's help, we will be again. Amen? Amen. And then he goes on to say, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, the reason sin is a reproach is because it separates us from whether it's one person or whether it's a nation or a family, it separates us from God. And God cannot look at sin with any degree of allowance, his word says. We can excuse sin and say, well, it wasn't that big, but God doesn't ever excuse sin. He can't because he's righteous. Our history books record the wreckage of once great empires all over the world. And here's why they failed. 
they self-destruct because they forgot the God of heaven. Oh, yeah. They just destroyed themselves. It didn't matter if anybody else destroyed them. They self-destructed. Again, I say, take a look at America. May it bring us to our knees to intercede for our great man. The lessons of history were meant to lead us back to God, saying, this is what I did when you honored me. God gives many warnings, as in the lives of the kings that we studied this morning. God spared Nineveh because of Jonah. Our beloved country has strayed from the godly foundations that our forefathers laid. Amen. If you want to know what it was like in the old days, read the Constitution. <clears throat> Look at the prayers of George Washington, our first president. He prayed and interceded for our country many times in many ways in his eight years as president and God heard his prayers and turned the tide of the battle. George Washington would not recognize our country if he saw it today. We have departed so far from the plans our forefathers had for us. We now call evil good and we call good evil. God's plan for us was to be a godly example to the world. Yeah. You remember what he told his disciples? Go into where? Oh, All the world. Yeah. And do what? Preach. Preach the gospel. That was God's plan. Was it a good plan? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Would our world be different today if we had carried out the Great Commission? Yes. Oh, absolutely. God is not willing that any should perish. The church is Christ's body. You and I are his hands, his feet, and his voice to the world. If we don't go, who will? If we don't give, who will? If we don't speak, who will? Rick brought such a beautiful devotion to the worship team this morning. He said when you walk up to someone and you have someone with you that they don't know, what do you do? You say, this is my friend and I'd like you to meet I did that for some of you this morning. When Connor brought Tyler in, he said, this is my friend Tyler, because I didn't know her until now. Rick reminded us that Jesus is always with us, living in us by his Holy Spirit. How good are we when we meet someone who doesn't know him? Good are we at introducing them to our friend? Or do we just let it go by? Yesterday I went to Ralph's to pick up a few groceries. And I had had them put three large cases of water in my basket, which I used to lift in easily. And uh, because I'm getting older, as you all know, I asked for help. So I had help loading it, and when I checked out, this young man said, may I help you to your car? And I said, oh yes, thank you. So as we walked, I asked him how his day was going, and he said, good, how's yours? And I said, good. He said, I thank the Lord every day for life. I said, so do I. <laughs> and I said to him, do you know Jesus? And this is what he said. I'm trying to find him. In America, I'm trying to find Jesus. I said, may I pray with you? He said, oh yes, please. So here we are, standing out in the middle of the parking lot. I'm detaining an employee to pray with him. Yes. It was such a sweet moment. I invited him to our church and pray that he'll come. His name is Luis. Will you help me pray for him? Yes. He's trying to find Jesus in America, and I know him. I love what Rick's mother-in-law told her doctor the other day. After the doctor's trying this and that, and it's not working and so on. And she said, I just want to go home and be with Jesus. 
He said, why would you do that? We're trying to get you well so you can stay here. And she said, why? Because I know him. I love him. I've served him all my life. I can't wait to see him. Can't wait to be there with my friends and family that have already gone. Wow. Introducing him to someone who doesn't know him. I'm sure the doctor is still thinking, wow, I haven't had a patient like that before. Okay. I wanted to not get well and go see Jesus. I want you to know that revival can save our nation. Did you hear me? Revival can change our nation. It's not too late because he hasn't come back yet. That's the only reason it's not too late. When the church prays, God works and God moves. Amen. God came to St. King Solomon one night in 2 Chronicles 7, 12. It records this. God said to him, I've heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then it goes on, verse 13. When I shut up heaven and there's no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or get this, or I send pestilence among my people. We've had a pestilence among us, haven't we? Some of you have been touched by that pestilence, and thank God you came safely through. Let's give God praise for our people. You came through because God is God and because we prayed and you prayed. And then he goes on in verse 14, and this is a verse we all know, and it's so precious right now. God said, when I do all those things, no rain, locusts, pestilence, when I do all that, if my people. How many of you are God's people? Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. All right. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Sometimes we kind of skip over that part. Will humble themselves. Remember what Daniel said when he came before the king? He said, you don't need to give me anything. I don't care about being third ruler in your kingdom care about God. Care about what he has to say. So God says, if you'll humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Now he's not talking to sinners in this verse. He's talking to God's people. He says, if my people will do these things, then I will do these things. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. What a deal. What a deal. Does America need healing? No. Do we have the formula? Yes. There it is. Humble ourselves. Say it with me. Humble, Humble ourselves. ourselves. Pray. Yes. Seek my face. And turn from my wicked ways. Do a heart check today, dear ones. Is there anything, anything I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing? Or anything I'm not doing that I should be doing. Don't have to answer me. This is a powerful promise with conditions. And when those conditions are met, God says he will do this. If you will humble yourself and pray, seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways, and this is what I'll do. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin, and I'll heal your land. What a promise. Does America need healing? We've got the formula. We've got his promise. Does God keep his promises? Yes. Every one of them. Has he ever kept a promise to you? Amen. He'll keep this one too. These promises are as true today as they were when they were written. This is the formula for restoring a lost country. This was God's response to Solomon's prayer of dedication for the temple. Day and night, God watched over his temple, his house of prayer, so that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and that's why God will save our country today, is so that men on earth will have to admit there is a God in heaven. 
Amen. Amen. God ordained many prophets and prophetesses in the Bible. We've talked about a few of them today. Daniel was one of those. They were often hated. They were misunderstood. They were exiled. They were punished. Some of them were put to death. But God's word remained in their mouth and they couldn't help but speak it. Amos 3, 7 says this, listen carefully. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God is telling us what's coming. If we're listening to the right voices, we're hearing it. The next verse says this, a lion has roared. Remember the lion of the tribe of Judah? He's roaring today. He has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? In our day, God has raised up a host of prophets in the church, and they are doing their job. Are we listening? Are we hearing the words of the prophets? God wants us to know his plan, his heart, his mind, so that we can prepare for his coming, and so that we will live without fear in the days ahead. I don't know if you've noticed it, but our world is blanketed in fear. Fear of COVID, fear of man, fear of war, fear of our enemies, fear of criminals, fear of lack, fear of loss. But that's not what you and I are to do. We are God's people. And I'll tell you who you are in a moment. It's amazing. Many times in the New Testament, Jesus said, fear not. The only fear we need to have is the fear of God. Amen. And that's a holy, reverential awe. Not, uh, but wow, I recognize his presence. He's here. He's working in my life. The psalmist in Psalm 111 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We begin to be wise when we have a holy fear of our God. Wise men have a godly fear of reverential awe as we try to comprehend his mighty works and the magnitude of who he is. Psalm 112 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Jesus taught the fear of God in Matthew chapter 10 verse 27. He said these words, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop. Do not fear those who kill the body, but fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And Jesus continues to tell us how precious we are to our creator. Verse 30, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I don't know about you, but every morning when I comb my hair a lot come out, so that means God has to do a renumbering, right? Yeah. And I like to think that he's put a number on every hair. That was number 2,563 that you lost today. That's how much he cares about you. The Bible says that he even notices when a little sparrow falls to the ground. Do you ever see a little dead bird on the ground? I just look at it and say, God noticed you. Yes, he did. Jesus continues in verse 31, Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Did you know that? You are of more value than many sparrows. Your Heavenly Father loves you and cares for you. Israel was in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. I can imagine generation after generation thought, is God ever going to keep his promise to deliver us out of Egypt? 400 years would be a long time. <clears throat> Did God deliver them out of Egypt? Yes. Yes. Majestically, you've all seen the movie, right? God delivered them, he kept his word. Matthew 10, 16 says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'd like to tell you the hard fight is over, but probably it isn't. But God has not left us without all the preparation and all the weapons and all the tools that we need. He said, go out and be wise as serpents and harmless 
as doves. It was a nice sit on our front porch in these nice cool evenings of San Diego, which the rest of the world does not enjoy. And we see doves flying near our home. Sometimes they even dare to come into our yard and stay a while. I think, wow, a dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's so precious to see them. And so Jesus says, be as wise as a serpent and as harmless. And he goes on to say, you will be hated of all men for my name's sake. I know that's not very good news, but he wants us to know what's coming. There are some hard times ahead. But then he says, he that endures how long? Yeah. To the end. What will happen to him? He shall be saved. Let's say that together. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. I don't know when the end is. I don't know what it is for you or for me or for all of us. Because I'm not God. But I'm like Sister Angelus. I know him. I love him. I serve him. I can't wait till he comes back. I want to spend eternity with him. How about you? Amen. But I don't want to go empty handed. I want to bring Luis and a whole bunch of other people who are out there looking for Jesus. They're trying to find him. Yes. It's not hard to find, but they don't know that. So we have to tell them. Remember who you are. It goes on, verse 26. Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed. Are we having some things covered up in our day? Do you feel like you're being told the truth? This is what Jesus said. Don't be afraid of them, for the things they've tried to cover will be revealed, and things that are hidden will be made known. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. You and I don't know the truth, but we know the one who is. Jesus said, I am the way to heaven. I am the truth, and I am the life. Whoever comes to me, I won't turn him away. It's wonderful. In our day, where the truth has been hidden, watch for it to be revealed. You're going to hear it on your news, some news. Nothing can be hidden from God's sight. And he will reveal to us what we need to know. Who's he going to tell it to first? The prophets. And they will declare truth to you. And you will know what to do. Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, now, when these things that I just talked about begin to happen, look up. This is when you're hated by all men, when hidden things are being revealed. Jesus said, that's the time to look up, and here's why. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So the more lies we see revealed, the more truth that is made plain to us, look up. It's almost over. Redemption draws near. Jesus said in Matthew 24 42, we don't know the day nor the hour. It wouldn't be real fair, would it, if we knew he was coming on December 16th, my birthday? <laughs> what would you all do before December 16th? that you aren't doing now. You don't have to answer to me. <laughs> we would want to be sure we were ready, wouldn't we? Yes. On December 16th. But he says, we don't know the day nor the hour. Even the angels in heaven don't know, and they're with him every day. I'll tell you, even <coughs> Jesus doesn't know. I think it would break his heart if he knew. Because he would say, oh, Father, could we wait one more day? These people over here don't know me yet, and they might come if you would wait another day. Only the Father knows when the Son is going to return. Some days I think he must be waiting on tiptoes and saying, God, can I go get them now? They've had enough. But then God says, wait a minute, I've got to bring a few more people in before. 
Jesus goes on to say in verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 9, 37, The harvest is plentiful. It's white. It's ready. But what's the problem? You know that verse. The laborers are few. I had a dear man in our congregation say to me this morning, Pastor, I want to help out here. What can I do? What can I do to help the ministry in Southport? I love it. We have so many servants in this place that work so hard, week after week, day after day. They're not working for us. They're working for him. They're getting ready for the harvest. And Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Such a sad story. What a dilemma. I was telling someone this morning, every place I go, I see signs that say, help wanted. Help wanted. You go into restaurants, there's nobody to wait on you. You go into a grocery store, the lines are long. Today, Ruth and I went to Walmart, and there was a line halfway across the store. So, do we want to get in that? Do these things matter that much? Yeah, they did. So, we stayed in that. <laughs> <laughs> and another worker came up to the cashier and said, Do you want me to call for help? And she said, No, I'm doing okay. And it did begin to move a little faster. But Jesus said, The harvest is ready, the laborers are few. Will you go out and be a laborer in his harvest? Yeah. You don't have to answer to me. But each of us has our own harvest field in front of us. Yeah. Yesterday, mine was at Ralph's for that brief moment with Luis. I didn't know he'd be there. I'm going to look him up and check on him. See if he found Jesus. crop ready to be harvested. There aren't enough laborers. May Southport go out 100% and labor in the field God has left you in. Amen. That's your field. It's different than mine. I won't be responsible for the people that you see every day. I'm responsible for mine. I couldn't stand it on that day. If somebody came up to me and said, I was your neighbor. I saw you every day. You never told me about Jesus. And now you're going to heaven and I'm going to hell. I couldn't stand that, could you? Peter wrote these words in 1 Peter 2.9. It tells us who we are after that assignment to go in as sheep among wills, wolves and be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. And then Jesus said, if you endure to the end, you'll be safe. This is what Peter says we are. You are a chosen generation. As I read those words, they hit home to me. I said, God, what an amazing day to be alive. You and I are a chosen generation. God's chosen us to be alive in this troubled, mixed up world. Other generations have come and gone. But we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We don't need gold chains and royal garments. We know who we are. We're a holy nation. We're his own special people. And then he says, this is why I've called you to that, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Amen. 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 How many of you came out of darkness into the light of the gospel? Amen. We all did, didn't we? Thank you, Jesus. What a privileged assignment he has given to us. But then there's one more part. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And here's a description of those. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, 
and marrying and giving in marriage. How long? Until the day Noah entered the ark. Right up till the last minute of their life. That's what they were doing. Does that sound like our world? Every place I go, I see people eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Until the flood came, and then here's what happened. It took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That means as unexpected and unprepared as they were, so it will be in our world when Jesus comes back. Amen. People who are just going on with business as usual, eating, drinking, getting married, whatever. Life going on. People totally unaware until Jesus comes and goes and it's too late. Because you know what the Bible says it's going to be this fast. In the twinkling of an eye. Blink your eye. It's over. It's done. History is recorded. In the twinkling of an eye. The sky will be rolled black. The Son of Man will appear. The sound of a trumpet. And we who are alive and remain what will happen to us? Caught up. That's the rapture. Are you afraid of heights? You won't be that day. <laughs> I am afraid of heights. But I'm depending on looking into that face. Oh yeah. Caught up. How long will we be with Jesus? Forever. How long is forever? That's it. That's it. See the prize that you're working for? Yes. Better than gold chains and being third ruler in the kingdom, isn't that? Yes. Those things don't matter. Oh, dear ones. So shall this coming of the Son of Man be. Life going on as usual. Call comes. It's all over. May we be watchful ready 24 7 no time off no vacations from jesus and let's come and bring as many as we can as we prepare for the coming of the son of man will you pray with me father not an easy message to give and not an easy message to hear in part of it Lord, I pray that every person listening will be stirred in the deeps of their soul to be watchful and ready and to be focused on bringing as many as we can with us. This morning, I don't know all of you personally, if there's anyone in this room who does not know Jesus, and you would like today to be the day that you just say yes to him forever. Would you slip your hand up so we can pray with you? Anybody in this room? Just not sure if I'm ready to meet him. If he came today, what would he say? Would I have a good report? Or would he turn me away and say, depart from me, I never knew you?
no one else like our Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're going to be baptized today, would you go now and prepare? And we'll meet you downstairs. And the rest of you would like to invite you to stay with us, be our audience, and enjoy a light lunch with us. Thank you for coming today. Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had of worshiping together. We pray, Lord, that you will guide our steps in the next moments, throughout the next days, Lord. As long as we have breath within us, Lord, may we introduce everyone to the one that lives within us with great joy.